and talk to us about the impact that this demographic shift can have on our church or is having on our church and also on our educational system. Dr. Williams, we'd like to welcome you here, and we're very thankful that you could come and join us. Very thankful to your president <laughs> for the kind words of introduction. Is there anything worthy of praise? Give praise to Jesus. And secondly, recognize that a foundation in Christian education is not a barrier to success in this world, regardless of how you measure it. That is a message that needs to be given to the North American Division constituency. I've worked at three of the most elite universities in the United States, and parents come to me all the time wanting to know how to get their children into college at these institutions. I have sent my three children, our graduates, two of Oakwood and one of Andrews. Um, my wife and I are strong supporters of Christian education, and we believe that there's never been a greater need for Christian education than today. Yeah. And that is a message that our churches need to hear from the leadership of the churches. All right, I'm going to talk about how we can be more effective in ministry in the contemporary context uh, that our president spoke about. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to begin by sharing you with the science. I'm going to use the lens of health, because that's what I study. I study health. I'm going to use the lens of health to illustrate the challenges we face in our urban centers today, the challenges we face in our nation today, and then talk about what God has called us to do in the space of health that will produce the evangelistic results that we are longing for. All right, so let's begin with some science. Socioeconomic status, whether measured by income, education, occupational status, poverty, or wealth, is one of the strongest predictors of valuable resources in our society. So let's take one example, the SAT test. You're all familiar with that, the scholastic aptitude test that some people are calling the student affluence test. Why? Because here is national data on SAT scores by family income. And what you can see at every higher level of family income, SAT scores increase. That should raise fundamental questions to us about what exactly does the SAT score capture since it reflects the economic resources that households have. What's true of the SAT score is also true of health. Here is a study I published with other colleagues several years ago looking at national data for the United States life expectancy at age 25. And as you move from poor to near poor to middle income to high income, Life expectancy increases in a graded manner. And if you look by education, you see the same pattern uh, from less than high school education to high school graduates to some college to college degrees or more education, education, life expectancy increases. And what's true of life expectancy is true of every measure of health, not just in the United States, but virtually in every country of the world. Socioeconomic status, the strongest predictor of variations in health. And then there are large racial ethnic differences in health. I'm giving you one statistic, infant mortality. The chances that a baby will die before its first birthday, and you see African Americans with the highest rates of infant mortality. This is deaths per 1,000 live births. Then Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders, then American Indians and Alaska Natives, then Latinos, then whites, then Asians. So there's a graded relationship that pattern in the US is true everywhere else in the world where there are racialized societies and where we have data in the interest of time. I'll show you one other country. Here is life ex infant mortality by ethnicity in England and Wales. And you can see Pakistani have the highest, then comes blacks from Africa and then Bangladeshi, blacks from the Caribbean, Indians, then whites, then other whites. Other whites mainly refer to Euro European immigrant whites and in England, as in the United States, immigrants of all racial groups have better health than their native-born counterparts. 
But with increasing length of stay and generational status, the health of immigrants declines. The American way of life seems to be dangerous to their health. That's what the data tell us. And racial inequities in health are quite persistent over time. Here is national data for the United States. Life expectancy uh, from 1950 to 2020 uh, for blacks and whites, the only two groups. We have data going back that far. And if you look at the data, you could see in 1950, the average white person lived eight years longer than the average black person. The good news in the data, life expectancy through 2010 has increased for whites, has increased for blacks. But let's look at some intriguing things in the data. Look at the life expectancy of whites in 1950, 69.1 years, eight, eight year gap. How long did it take for blacks to equal the life, the health that whites had in 1950? 1990, 40 years later, took 40 years for blacks to equal the health that whites had in 1950. And if we look at the data in 2010, you see the gap is four years and something happened between 2010 and 2020. And you can see the life expectancy declined, the trend always upward declined in 2020 for blacks and for whites, a bigger decline for whites, a four year gap in 2010, a six year gap in 2020. What happened? The COVID-19 pandemic. Life expectancy declined in 2019, a larger decline than we have seen since 1944. Decline for black males more, and Hispanic males more than three years, for Hispanic and black females more than two years, for white males and females more than a one year decline. Every group declined as a result of the impact of COVID-19. And so things are worse now than they were in 2010. How do we make sense of these large racial ethnic differences in health? Well, there are large racial ethnic differences in socioeconomic status. Here's 2018 data on median household income uh, for whites, Asians, Hispanics, American Indians, and blacks. I like to translate the data. These are the actual numbers in a way you can't miss the point. So I've standardized the household income of whites as $1. For every dollar of household income white households receive in 2018, um, <clears throat> Asian households receive a dollar and 23 cents. Several caveats to keep in mind. Asians of any group in America is the highest proportion of uh, immigrants. Almost two thirds of Asians in the United States are immigrants. They've come to the United States with high levels of education. They have high levels of education and college completion than whites, for example. But equally important, Asians have more persons contributing to household income. They're more likely to live in what we call multi-generational households. So if I had a per person measure of income, whites would be the highest. But a household measure with more persons contributing to income, Asians are the highest. But let's look at the historically disadvantaged groups. For every dollar of household income, white households receive in 2018, Latino households receive 73 cents, and African American and Native American households receive 59 cents. Do you know what is stunning about a 59 cents figure for blacks in 2018? That is identical to the black-white gap in income in 1978. 1978 was the peak year of the narrowing of the black-white gap in income as a result of the civil rights movement and the anti-poverty policies of the 60s and 70s. It had been reduced to 59 cents, and in 2018, it is still 59 cents. Has it been stuck at 59 cents all this time? No, it got worse throughout the decade of the 1980s. Reaganomics was not good to the black community. And it was not until the mid-1990s it got back up to 59 cents, and it's a penny up and down since then. What I'm saying is the racial ethnic gaps in income, which has implications if we have increasing numbers of populations within our, our congregations, um, we have made much less progress as a society than most of my students think than most of Americans think. We are, in 2018, exactly where we were in 1978. And the large gaps in income markedly understate the racial gap in economic circumstances. What do I mean when I say that? Well, income captures the flow of resources into the household. 
It tells us nothing about the economic reserves that households have to cushion shortfalls of income. We get that from data on wealth. And according to the Federal Reserve Board, for every dollar of wealth that white households have, black households have 10 pennies and Latino households have 12 pennies. And you ask what are responsible for the racial differences in wealth? Two big factors. Number one, I'll give you the fancy term eco economists use, intergenerational transfers of wealth. What that means is that whites are more likely to inherit wealth when relatives die, blacks and Latinos are more likely to scramble to pay for the funeral expenses when relatives die. Second factor, racial ethnic differences in home ownership and home equity. Um, uh, their policies that historically have disadvantaged uh, persons of color from purchasing homes, and that has led to racial ethnic differences in home ownership and dramatic differences in home equity. And policies of segregation that I'll talk about in a minute also have had a huge negative impact. What this means is that even though we all may be in the same church, but all of our members are not in the same boats. And when a pandemic hits, some boats are much better able to weather the storm than others. And we need to understand that. And then there is, I've talked about socioeconomic status and how powerful a predictor of variations in health it is. What we have discovered is there is an added burden of race. And I'll give you an example of going back to the same data I looked at life expectancy at age 25. Um, and I'm gonna show you just the education data here. The, at age 25, the average white person lives five years longer than the average black person. So the five year gap. But if we look within whites by education, whites with a college degree, or more, live 6.4 years longer than whites who have not finished high school. So the gap within race by education is bigger than the racial gap, and you can see within African Americans it's a 5.3 year gap. Again, bigger than the racial gap. So socioeconomic status, education, and income is a bigger predictor of health than race. At the same time, race matters at every level of education. So. Looking at these data, white high school dropouts at age 25 live 3.1 years longer than black high school dropouts. And you know what happens? The racial gap widens as education increases. This is national data for the United States. The best of African Americans, those with a college degree or more education, have the long longest life expectancy among African Americans. But they have shorter life expectancy than whites with a college degree, than whites with some college education, than whites who have graduated from high school. What do these data tell us? They tell us there's something about income and education that matters for your health, regardless of your race. But there's something else about race that matters even after we've taken income and education into account. And researchers have been asking, could racism be a critical missing piece of the puzzle to understand the patterning of racial differences in health. And when I use the term racism, I'm not talking about individual behaviors and beliefs. Primarily, I'm talking about the system. A system that has categorized and ranked groups, devalues and disempowers some, its premises and ideology of inferiority. Yes, it can give rise to negative attitudes and beliefs, attitudes, prejudice, stereotypes. It can give rise to differential treatment by individuals and social institutions. I, Today, in the interest of time, we'll talk to you about only one mechanism of racism, but it's a powerful one. Structural institutional racism. This is a paper I published in 2001. Um, talked about residential segregation and its history and how it shapes access to opportunity in the United States. And God is calling us to address the problems it has created is what I'm going to get to. Um, I, I, Paul, let me go back to this, residential segregation, the title of the paper, it's a fundamental cause of racial inequities in health. It means that if as the Adventist church we want to improve health and reduce the gaps in health that exist, we have to address. That's what fundamental cause means. If we don't address it, we can't fix the problem. And you're saying, what does segregation have to do with anything? I want to argue I'm not unique. This was John Sell was a historian at Duke University, wrote a book about the origins of segregation in the US, South, and South Africa. He argued that residential segregation by race was the single most successful domestic policy of the 20th century in the United States. It's beneath the radar screen. No politician is talking about it, but it has dramatic effects. I will show you in a minute. The other thing he shows, did you know 
that in the early 20th century, he shows this, the framers of apartheid in South Africa got the idea of apartheid from looking at how well residential segregation was working in the United States. They said, that's brilliant. We can implement that in our country. Okay, what does segregation have to do with anything? And why is Brother Williams talking about segregation to us? Well, think of segregation like a burglar at midnight. Once it shows up in a community, valuables disappear, like quality schools and safe playgrounds, and access to good jobs and a healthy environment and safe housing and tr good quality transportation and access to healthcare. All of these desirable resources, research reveals in this country varies by place, varies by neighborhood, varies by zip code, varies by where you live, and it's not an accident. You want evidence. I'm going to share with you three studies, all from Harvard researchers, William Julius Wilson and Robert Sampson, two of the country's most eminent sociologists, studied the 171 largest cities in America, said there's not even one city where whites live under equal conditions to those of blacks, and that the worst urban context in which whites reside is considerably better than the average context of black communities. That's what segregation has produced. Segregation has led to differences in access to opportunity. I'm sharing the work of the Professor Dolores Acevedo Garcia from Brandeis University. She's created a neighborhood opportunity index ranking every county in the United States on 29 different indicators of access to opportunity for kids. And what she finds in the 100 largest metropolitan area, who lives in very low and low opportunity neighborhoods? 67% of all black children, 58% of all Latino kids, 53% of all Native American kids live in very low or low opportunity neighborhoods compared to one in five white and Asian kids who lives in high and very high opportunity neighborhoods, almost two thirds of white and Asian children compared to about one in five black and Latino kids. So access to opportunity at a neighborhood level is striking in the United States. And segregation is linked to the quality of education because, well, not necessarily our schools, but public schools are funded locally. Residence is linked to public school quality um, and although there are more poor whites and poor blacks, I'll show you data on that in a minute, um, poor whites are not as concentrated in poor neighborhoods the way um, uh, poor whites are not as the way poor blacks are. And so in high poverty schools, this is what the research shows, less qualified teachers, lower teacher expectations, deteriorated buildings, less safe neighborhoods, more limited curricula, few connections with colleges and employees. So real disadvantage. And these are problems that is, are common in poor kids, more likely to encounter violence, abuse, alcoholism, divorce, and destruction. Um, there are things we can do to improve schools. I'm gonna talk about what we do for outreach in a minute. But research finds that when teachers experience school leadership that is strong and supportive, so the leadership of the schools matter profoundly, this is what the research shows, and the teachers are willing to work together and are in agreement about the goals and approaches towards teaching, students, even in poor schools, can perform better regardless of their socioeconomic background. But high quality teaching is especially important with students from low socioeconomic status background. And in America, in general, we have the best teachers teaching the students with the greatest needs, with the least needs. And those with the greatest needs have poorer quality teachers in general. Segregation is the central driver of large racial ethnic differences in income and education. I was going to tell you the power of segregation. I'm showing you two more studies from Harvard researchers. This is David Cutler. Uh, one of the country's leading economists. He did a national study looking at blacks and whites making it in the labor force. Did you know what he found? Statistically, if you could eliminate, if you could erase residential segregation, you'd completely erase black-white differences in income, in education, and in unemployment. And reduce black-white differences in single motherhood by two-thirds. Why? All of these striking differences are linked to opportunity at a neighborhood level. And then Rash Chetty, another Harvard economist, asked an intergenerational question. He said, let's look at black and white children who start out life in families with the same level of household income. How are the children doing in the next generation? And he found in 99% of census tracts in America, black boys earn less income than white boys, even when they start out life at the same level of household income. 
Why? Because they're lazy? No. They're not working hard enough? No. They live in neighborhoods that differ in access to opportunity. So we need to think about the needs of our communities. That's where I'm going. And, and meet those needs. And that's what we've been asked to do by Jesus. I will show you in a minute. Black boys do as well as white boys in neighborhoods with good resources, but <laughs> that's not true for most of them in this country. What I'm saying is that these inequities that we see do not reflect a broken system. They reflect a carefully crafted system, functioning as plans, successfully implementing social policies, many of which were rooted in racism. They're not random events. They're not acts of God. They don't reflect the behaviors of these individuals and the failures. They show the ways in which upstream mechanisms, and I've just talked to you about one mechanism, race, it's residential segregation, has produced a truly rigged system in the United States. And segregation leads to higher levels of exposure to a broad range of stressors. This is a probability sample of adults in Chicago. I conducted a study when I was at the University of Michigan with other colleagues, and we found that US-born Latinos and African Americans have higher levels of stress. Every type of stressful life experience we assess, they were worse off on, and leads to poorer physical health and poorer mental health. And I haven't listed on here the stress of racial discrimination because that's another talk. And segregation leads to higher exposures to chemical stresses. This is a report came out this year showing in highly segregated areas, uh, persons who live there are more likely to be dumped on or poisoned in their homes. They breathe air that is three times more toxic. They breathe in more pollution, greater density of, of problems with natural gas, um, more likely to live close to dirty energy. Um, mothers and babies have worse pregnancy outcomes linked to heat and air pollution. So it's just the places where they live, just, just all the negative effects of climate change are more intense in those places. And this air pollution is affecting even the academic performance of the elementary school kids. And what this study shows, not only is the air pollution an independent predictor of lower test scores in reading, but that even when you do a remedial program and the kids are exposed to air pollution, the remedial program does not have as powerful an effect. Segregation is a central driver of the elevated rates of violent crime. This is the last example, and then I want to talk about solutions. Um, but this is an important one. This is the work of Robert Sampson. High quality scientific studies, I'm su summarizing a book on one slide. He has shown that residential segregation leads to lack of access of jobs at a community level, high male unemployment and underemployment. Under those conditions, you have high rates of auto wedlock births, female-headed households, a concentration of urban poverty. With female-headed ho head households, you have lower supervision of adolescent males. And these factors lead to increased risk of violent crime and homicide. What Samson shows is that the predictors of violent crime and homicide in the United States are identical across race. The same factors, male unemployment, concentrated poverty, family structure, predict identically across race. But violent crime is more common among blacks because blacks are more exposed to the conditions that drives them. But the same factors predict exactly the same. In other words, the differences we see in adolescent risk behavior are linked to the availability of jobs, concentrated poverty, and lack of opportunities for marriage and family structure at a neighborhood level. How do we address the family structure problems? I just want to give you uh, one example. Uh, the Heritage Foundation suggests that the poor aspire to healthy marriage but lack the norms, understanding, and skills to achieve it. And so they suggest that the government should provide information to poor communities so they know what to do because they just lack the skills. Um, I want to share with you what scientists have known for a long time. The decision of two people to get married is the most personal decision you can imagine two people making, correct? But do you know we can predict rates of marriage by looking at op economic opportunities for men? So marriage rates increase when average male earnings increase nationally in the United States, and marriage rates decline when male unemployment increases. So if you want to increase rates of marriage, you just need to increase opportunities, economic opportunities for men. Dr. Jay Teachman, that's his picture here, the sociologist, 
he asks, well, Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To lose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free and that you break every rogue? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring you to your house the poor who are cast out, when you see the naked that you cover him and hide not yourself from your own flesh? Ellen White quotes Isaiah 58 a lot. This is New Living Testament. If somebody wanted it, more problems with natural gas, um, more likely to live close to dirty energy. Um, mothers and babies have worse pregnancy outcomes linked to heat and air pollution. So it just the places where they live, just, just all the negative effects of climate change are more intense in those places. And this air pollution is affecting even the academic performance of the elementary school kids. And what this study shows, not only is the air pollution an independent predictor of lower test scores in reading, but that even when you do a remedial program and the kids are exposed to air pollution, the remedial program does not have as powerful an effect. Segregation is a central driver of the elevated rates of violent crime. This is the last example, and then I want to talk about solutions. Um, but this is an important one. This is the work of Robert Sampson. High quality scientific studies, I'm su summarizing a book on one slide. He has shown that residential segregation leads to lack of access of jobs at a community level, high male unemployment and underemployment. Under those conditions, you have high rates of auto wedlock births, female-headed households, a concentration of urban poverty. With female-headed households, you have lower supervision of adolescent males. And these factors lead to increased risk of violent crime and homicide. What Samson shows is that the predictors of violent crime and homicide in the United States are identical across race. The same factors, male unemployment, concentrated poverty, family structure, predict identically across race. But violent crime is more common among blacks because blacks are more exposed to the conditions that drives them. But the same factors predict exactly the same. In other words, the differences we see in adolescent risk behavior are linked to the availability of jobs, concentrated poverty, and lack of opportunities for marriage and family structure at a neighborhood level. How do we address the family structure problems? I just want to give you uh, one example. Uh, the Heritage Foundation suggests that the poor aspire to healthy marriage but lack the norms, understanding, and skills to achieve it. And so they suggest that the government should provide information to poor communities so they know what to do, because they just lack the skills. Um, 
I want to share with you what scientists have known for a long time. The decision of two people to get married is the most personal decision you can imagine two people making, correct? But do you know we can predict rates of marriage by looking at op economic opportunities for men? So marriage rates increase when average male earnings increase nationally in the United States, and marriage rates decline when male unemployment increases. So if you want to increase rates of marriage, you just need to increase opportunities, economic opportunities for men. Dr. J. Teachman, that's his picture here, the sociologist, he asked, well, let's see if we can find examples where there's greater increases in economic opportunity for men and let's understand its impact on marriage. So he looked at military enlistment. I'm not a fan of military enlistment, but this is what his study showed. Military enlistment, black men in the military earn more than in the civilian, um, uh, their civilian peers and there's less discrimination in the military than in the civilian sector. That's what research shows. And what he found is that if black men and white men enroll in the military, one study shows it promotes marriage over cohabitation. Another study shows it increases the likelihood of first marriage. A third study shows it leads to greater stability of marriage. And guess what? All the effects are stronger for black males than for whites. So providing economic opportunity increases marriage. So what's poverty in America? I just want to show you some numbers. This is 2021, $13,000 for a family, two people, 16,000, four people, 26,496. I want to show you some data on poverty and race 2020. You can see about one in five blacks are poor. The highest rates of poverty is among American Indians, 23%. Among Asians, it's 8%. Among Hispanics, 17%. Among whites, it's 8.2%. But if we look at poor people in America, in millions of people, the largest group of poor people are whites. There's almost 16 million poor whites, almost twice the number of poor whites as poor African Americans, 8.5 million, 10.4 million Latinos, 1.6 million Asians, and so on. Okay, I've talked about problems that exist in our society. What can we do about them? But the real question is, what has God called us to do about them? Isaiah 58, 6 and 7. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To lose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked that you cover him and hide not yourself from your own flesh. Ellen White quotes Isaiah 58 a lot. This is New Living Testament if somebody wanted it more, more contemporary language. Um, but the bottom line is 2 Corinthians 5.15 say that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him who died and rose again. Or as Christ's subject lesson says, Christ's followers have been redeemed for service. Our Lord teaches that the true object of life is ministry. Christ himself was a worker, and to all his followers, he's given the law of service, service to God and service to man. And yes, there are many opportunities for ministry for us as a church. Church members can and should deliberately and intentionally spur compassion educate about social justice, engender empathy, initiate and sustain living demonstrations that model God's love that is actively meeting the needs of hurting humanity. And I'm gonna expand on what that means to actively meet the needs of hurting humanity. Ministry of healing, truth that is not lived, that is not imparted, loses its life-giving power, its healing, its virtue. Its blessing can be retained only as it is shared. So how do we work with others? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus pitched his tent beside ours. And that's what he's calling us to do. Christ's ministry of healing, page 143. Christ's methods alone will give us true success in reaching the people. The savior mingled with others as one who decided they're good. We cannot separate ourselves from them, from their areas, from the disadvantaged communities where they live. He showed his sympathy. He ministered to their needs. He won their confidence. Then he bade them uh, follow me. 
And we have been called to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And we shall find his footprints beside the sick bed, the hovels of poverty of the cities I've been talking about, the crowded alleys of the city, and in every place where there are human hearts in need of consolation, in doing as Jesus did when on earth, we shall walk in his steps. And that's what he's calling us to do. What is true religion? A true religion that leads men to place a low estimate upon human beings whom Christ has esteemed of such value as to give himself for them. A religion that would lead us to be careless about human needs, suffering, or rights is a spurious religion. In slighting the claims of the poor, the suffering, the sinful, we are proving ourselves traitors to Christ. I'm not saying that. I am reading it. It is because men take upon themselves the name of Christ, while in life they deny his character, that Christianity has so little power in the world. Mount of Blessings, page 37. Testimonies, volume 4, 226. Any human being who needs our sympathy and our kind offices is our neighbor. The suffering and destitute of all classes are our neighbors. And when their wants are brought to our knowledge, it is our duty to relieve them as far as possible. First, meet the temporal necessities of the needy and relieve their physical wants and sufferings, and you will find an open avenue to the heart. First, meet their needs is what we are told. What would a comprehensive ministry look like? Yes, the church encourages comprehensive ministry, instruction and principles of health in nutrition, cooking schools, simple treatments, uh, child care, ministering in church and health clinics, uh, health combined with public evangelism, health conditioning centers, comforting the afflicted, equipping individuals with job skills so they can earn a living wage as part of health ministry, caring and providing for people and their problems. What does it mean to represent Jesus in ministry? Well, we need to make the compassion of Jesus real to hurting individuals and communities. Yes, 1 Peter 2.5 says we need to be like living stones built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Our marching orders, Christ has given the church, according to Acts of the Apostles, a sacred charge. Every member should be a channel through which God can communicate to the world the treasures of his grace. There is nothing that the Savior desires so much as angels, agents, sorry, who will represent to the world his spirit and his character. There's nothing that the world needs so much as the manifestation through humanity of the Savior's love. And all the needs I've described provide opportunities to share God's love. And all heaven is waiting for men and women through whom God can reveal the power of Christianity. What does it mean to represent Jesus in ministry? We need to be obedient to Jesus. What did Jesus say? On the great day of judgment, what will determine our destiny. I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. A sm the stranger is an old English word for, I was an immigrant, and you invited me in. Ponder that. Naked, and you clothed me. Sick, and you visited me. In prison, and you came unto me. And in case you missed it, Desire of Ages comments, Christ pictured to his disciples the scene of the great judgment day and presented his decision as turning up on one point. What have we done or failed to do for Jesus in the person of the poor and suffering? The problem of our world, what is it? The misapprehension of God. Men are losing their knowledge of his character. And at this time, a message is to be proclaimed. God's character is to be made known, and we make it known by reflecting his goodness his mercy, his truth, his love, as we meet the needs of suffering humanity. The last rays of merciful light, Christ subject lessons, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love, and God is asking us to train our church members so they can be equipped to do this. Christ is waiting with longing desire for what? the manifestation of himself in his church. And when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, he will come. And it is our privilege not only to look for, but to hasten the coming. 
were all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly the last great harvest would be ripened and Christ would come. God has given us a commandment to love as he has loved us. And if we humble ourselves and did this work, kind, tender-hearted, full of pity, there would be 100 conversions to the truth where now there is only one. I'm reading this, my brothers and sisters. What would a comprehensive ministry look like? I want us to go back in history. We have done this before. In 1893, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, Medical Missionary Belivenant Association operated a special outreach in Chicago, made Dr. John Harvey Kellogg its president. And what did he do? He read Ellen White's books. He said an article in 1885 on city missions and multiple articles in the review on our duty to the poor and the afflicted. And he said they were the blueprint for what he did. And what did Kellogg do? He offered a free medical clinic, a clothing distribution program, a homeless shelter, a soup kitchen, uh, work in the shelter, a lifeboat rescue home, a maternity home, uh, a farm outside the city for drug rehabs and the homeless, a school for Chinese. In 1882, America had passed the Chinese Exclusion Act. Chinese were a dis despised population in America in 1893, and he did a special outreach to them a visiting home nurse service. Let me just come in quickly on some of these. Um, the workman's home was a shelter in Chicago. The church operated 400 persons a night it could serve. The shelter wasn't free. To be eligible, the applicant had to agree to take a bath, have his clothing fumigated. He had to pay uh, 10 cents uh, for a meal. But if you didn't have the money, they'd give you the money because there was a way for you to get the money in the shelter itself. Um, there was a reading room. There was a hall for religious services. Um, and so forth, but there was also something else. Uh, I'm going to come back to the, what it says. There was a place, an industrial department, where men could work and earn a skill and earn money to pay for their time in the shelter. And where did this idea come from? From Ministry of Healing. Ellen White says, the church should give attention to the establishment of various industries so poor families can find employment. That's part of our evangelistic work. Ministry of Healing, page 194. Carpenters, blacksmiths, and indeed everyone who understands some line of useful labor should feel a real responsibility to teach and help the ignorant and unemployed. By instruction and practical lines, she continues, Ministry of Healing, we can often help the poor most effectively. He was simply implementing what Ellen White says all of us need to be doing. And then there was a farm, an outpost center. Persons who wanted to get off of drugs could go out to the farm, and on the farm, they grew truck produce that supplied the, the, the shelter um, in, in town and the feeding that was being done uh, in the city of Chicago. And Kellogg's plan was to create a farm that could support uh, uh, 400 men. And what else did they do? Three programs focused on vulnerable women. It was estimated there were 10,000 to 25,000 prostitutes in Chicago. The maternity home was established in 1896, could provide shelter to 20 girls who were pregnant, needed a place to go. More daring was the lifeboat rescue service. It began with four Seventh-day Adventists, morally upright women, who would go to the red light district of Chicago by night to talk to street walkers, viewed as the most desperate class of prostitutes. Working in teams of two, they worked until midnight or 1 AM. They were successful during their first year of persuading 75 girls to leave the street and return to a better life. And if the women wanted to leave that life, they could direct them to the rescue home, which was also for unwed mothers. And then Kellogg opened a medical school in Chicago. Did you know this? This is part of Adventist history. A medical school in Chicago that graduated over 200 physicians in 15 years. At a dormitory in the medical school, there was a settlement house. It was a home base for eight visiting nurses. I'm talking about a comprehensive program of meeting the urban needs following the Spirit of Prophecy Council. 
It sponsored many activities, a kindergarten, a day nursery for working moms, a free laundry for women, an employment agency, classes in first aid, hygiene, diet, child training, a placement service for orphans, a placement service for men and women who reclaim from Skid Row. This is the Adventist church at work following the ministry of healing back in 1893. Let, what does Sister White say? Let the members of poor households be taught how to cook, how to make and mend their own clothing, how to nurse the sick, how to care properly for the home. Let the boys and girls be thoroughly taught some useful trade or occupation. This is evangelism. There are multitudes of children who have been wholly deprived of guidance of parents and the subdued influence of a Christian home. Let Christians open their hearts and homes to these helpless ones. And so the medical training in Chicago, the students organized 70 clubs among newsboys, boot black street kids, and a visiting program to the city jails. Again, meeting people at the area of their need. And the world looked at it and marveled. The founder of the American Public Health Association, not a Seventh-day Adventist, said the SDA Medical School in Chicago was the most important educational institution in the world. Now, we know Kellogg didn't last. It grew and declined. Um, but there are opportunities for us. I want to close by just sharing with you a few examples because our health system needs to be recruited to this work. So I want to give you a few examples of what health systems could do. A rooftop farm. This is the Boston Medical Center, the safety net um, hospital in the city of Boston, recently created a rooftop farm, adapted their roof, had one fundraising event, raised the $300,000 to adapt their roof so they can, on their roof, with one staff member and other volunteers, growing food to meet the needs in their neighboring community. Hospital is doing this. Loma Linda University Health. I'm a huge fan of Dr. Hart from the days I was a student at Loma Linda. Um, he has a heart for mission, and there's a large federally qualified health center that Loma Linda runs in San Bernardino, and they will, got money to build a new building. They created on the top floor, they will address unemployment in the city of San Bernardino. Because in the city of San Bernardino, less than 20% of students go on to any higher education. And so Loma Linda is offering a certified nurse's assistant, a pharmacy tech, a surgical tech, a community health worker program. It's an example of meeting community's needs at a broader level. Dignity Health, another health system, has invested over a number of years $90 million to create low-income housing, make housing affordable in the communities where they work. There's more that could be done. And I want to share with you a bold and breathtaking initiative from a healthcare institution. The Rush University Medical Center in Chicago has done something that is, in fact, amazing. Um, what they have done, discovered that there are huge disparities in the catchment area that they serve. In some neighborhoods, people live 16 years longer than in other neighborhoods they serve. And the poor neighborhoods are those with poor housing, low educational, highly segregated, high poverty, unsafe streets. Um, they said they would change their mission. Their mission was to provide health quality care. They said their mission now is to improve the health of the community. Has Adventist institutions made that? We need to encourage them to do that. They recruited five other health systems to join them. They created listening sessions with the community. Um, and they have decided to redirect their business enterprise to promote community wealth building and economic vitality. So this is the, their neighborhood. They want to reduce the gap in life expectancy in five years. These are their anchor points. They will name and eliminate racism, adopt an anchor mission, create wealth building opportunities, eliminate health care inequities, address the social and structural determinants of health in their population. They are essentially leverage their economic might to improve the lives of people in the communities they serve. Their goal is to hire, purchase, invest, volunteer locally, and focus all the business enterprise on improving community health. These are the strategies high and locally developed. I'm just going to through them, buy and source locally. I'm going to make my slides available so you can see them. And if we do this, we are promised Isaiah 58, 
They are blessings if we give ourselves to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted. Then our light will shine in darkness and our health shall spring forth speedily and the glory of the Lord will be our great reward. What is holding us back? Three reasons for disobedience. One is, we say we don't have the money to do it. How did Kellogg solve the money problem? When he wanted to do the farm, he told the medical students, let's pray. And within a week, a wealthy patient at a sanitarium in Battle Creek said to him, is there anything I can do to help the work in Chicago? And he had a farm in Chicago, and Kellogg told him the need, and he devoted it. Worry is blind and cannot discern the future, but Jesus sees the end from the beginning in every difficulty you will ever encounter in your life. God has one hundred, a thousand ways to provide for you of which we know nothing. If we don't ask him, we don't get it. We have not because we ask not. What's the other excuse we use? Our church is too small. But Ellen White says the medical missionary work should be the part of the work of every church in every place in connection with the establishment of our churches. The relief of bodily suffering opens the way for the healing of the soul in every city where we have a church. Every church needs to be involved in this work. And somebody says, but this is too hard. Jesus has said he's going to be with us. We can do all things through him. Be strong and have a good courage. Do not fear or be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is going to be with thee. We are not to let the future, Ellen White says. With his hard problem, his unsatisfying prospects, make our hearts faint, our needs tremble, our hearts hang down. Let him take hold of my strength, says the mighty one, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. Whatever our situation, if we turn to the Lord, we have a sure counselor. Whatever our sorrow, our loneliness, we have a sympathizing friend. If we would humble ourselves before God, be kind and courteous, tender-hearted, and full of pity to the needs of humanity where God has placed us, there will be 100 conversions to the truth where now there is one. I leave you with God's promise. Has thou not known? Has thou not heard? The elastic God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth does not faint. He is not weary. He gives power to the faint. And to those who have no strength, he will increase might. Yes, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. But if we wait upon the Lord, he will renew our strength. We can mount up with wings as eagles. We can walk and not be weary. We can run and not faint. And we can do the work that God has called us to do. I'm a professor. I like to give homework. So I have a homework assignment for you. Go home. Don't take my word. Study Isaiah 58. Study the ministry of healing. And let's get about our father's business. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Williams. You've given us a...